All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Ray Jaramus is my name. I head up employee wellness at Employment Here. I'm really delighted to, to have you in the session today. We have been running a work from home wellness series over the past few weeks. And, and really what it was, uh, trying to get straight into action mode in response to the extended lockdown that we continue to be facing. And it looks like, uh, yeah, they're not going away anytime soon. So um, we're having a lot of conversations with uh, the HR managers uh, who, who use Employment Hero to, to solve their HR payroll and benefits, um, as well as our, our users, which are the employees, the, the, um, the individuals as, as well. And, and what we were starting to see is that there's a lot of uh, not frustration, but maybe the resilience credits are starting to run out and, and the question was put to us, how, do, how can we help better empower you as an HR manager or, or you as an individual uh, start to respond to this kind of new normal? Um, so with that, we've put together a, a couple of thought leaders in this space. We're really delighted with, with Matthew Green for today and I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of it. Um, as I go through the, the introduction of the presentation, I've asked for all of you to please uh, shoot through as many questions as you as you have throughout the session. There's no such thing as a silly question. Um, in my experience, if, if you've got a question, um, there may be yeah, others who have a, a very similar one. So please do uh, feel free to shoot it off. At the end, there's some really awesome goodies that we'll be uh, sharing around. So Matthew's been really generous and actually has a, a kind of, a, I guess, an announcement right around the, the book is recently published. So I'm, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of that. Um, with that, uh, just a quick introduction on Employment Hero for those that might not be too familiar with us. Uh, we exist to make employment easier and more rewarding for everybody. Uh, as we say, we, we tackle that through HR, payroll, and as part of today's is the benefits focus. Some quick facts around why we're here. Um, this is kind of the headline number that really created concern in, in our business and, and made us go straight into action mode, which was that Lifeline on the 3rd of August had their busiest day ever. It was over 3,000 calls. So um, chances are if, if you're starting to feel that your resilience credits are running out and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe starting to struggle a little bit, the reality is that's, that's not unique. It's, it's almost the rule. Um, when I originally put this down, Melbourne was 200 plus days in lockdown. Uh, I, I was in the car this morning and um, had heard that I think, unfortunately, Melbourne uh, holds the unfortunate record now of being the most days in lockdown around the world. Uh, we, we also recognise that wage growth in Australia is, is much lower than uh, living expenses, and, and that continues to create financial stress. So, uh, you know, that, that's an aspect. We've got the government who's rolling out over $290 billion worth of support since the pandemic's kicked off. Um, and these are a couple of key statistics that came off our most recent quarterly survey. 53% of employees rated their work-life balance as average to very poor. So about half of us are really struggling to get that balance right and dividing the lines between work and home life. Uh, but pleasingly, 63% rated their employer's commitment to well-being as being good or excellent. And that's really, these two stats are really what we're looking to address today. One is, if you are struggling with that work from home uh, and, and that balance, how can we provide information and little tools and tricks to give you um, yeah, to set you up for success. And if you're one of these employers in, in the 63% or, or, or not, um, what are the tools that we can provide you to empower your, your teams? And also as an HR manager, you're still a, an individual as well, right? So uh, there's really two, two layers. Uh, today is all around improving your physical health at home. So we have Matthew Green here. Matthew uh, is the CEO of Body Guide and author of I'm Sick of Being Sore. Uh, after 10,000 hours of working with patients, uh, Body Guide is uh, Matt's way of really giving back. Uh, it's a tool to help people help themselves, whether they can afford an appointment or not. Um, with that, Matt, I might ask you to come on camera and say hello. Did I? I, I unmuted myself before I started talking. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I'm really well, thanks. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and yeah, talk to you guys about some stuff that's really, I guess, you know, close to my heart and important and, and hopefully will really help people out with their bodies. So yeah, great to be here. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, just uh, he some headlines around the, the structure of today. We're really going to be diving into a number, number of key things. One, one of the things that really attracted me to Matt and his approach is 
trying to challenge the norms in, in, in health industry. It's like if we are, there are these rules of thumb or these things that we go through when we engage with mental health or physical health or just the health industry in general, how can we actually question whether or not that's the right thing to do and, and make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success? So I'd say that uh, Matt's almost uh, not a troublemaker in the health industry, but certainly has some contrarian views, which are always worth listening to. So delighted to, to hear that. Um, I won't share too much of Matt's structure. He'll dive into his presentation now, but uh, we're really going to be going to a lot of the philosophies around mental health and, and why this stuff is important. But at the end, we're going to start focusing on uh, what are the tools, the practical takeaways that you can start to adopt and actually change how you might do your, your job or, or, or work from home, uh, you know, even, even as early as, as from tomorrow. Um, with that, again, I'll, I'll stop screen sharing, Matt, and, and pass over to you, but I uh, do want to call out for all of the participants, please, interactive session, no, no uh, questions, a silly question. Uh, and also, I, I would like to call out that uh, let's, let's just agree between us that this is a bit of a safe space. So, uh, you know, what, what, we, what we talk about is, is kind of kept uh, in, in the trust tree and, you know, wellness can always get a little bit sensitive as, at, at times. So, um, let's just be mindful of that as well. Uh, with that, Matthew, I will stop sharing and pass over to you. All right, let's, uh, let's see how we go here. I'm notorious working in tech for always having tech difficulties. So let's everyone keep their fingers crossed that I do an okay job. Uh, can you guys see that? Yeah, that's it, mate. Full screen. That looks great. Great. Okay. So yeah, I'm Matt. Um, it's really exciting to be here. And today's session is, is not going to be too long or laborious. Uh, we're going to split it up into sort of three parts, a uh, quick introduction as to who I am. I think that's really important when we talk about health. Uh, body trivia, we're going to go through some questions that are designed to sort of open our minds up a little bit uh, and get us thinking a little bit differently about maybe some of the assumptions or instincts that we carry in the way that we deal with our physical health. And then we're going to go into, yeah, into hacks. So like simple things you can do that are really, really effective and other things that maybe you're doing that we can get rid of and save you some time and some energy at the end of which we do a Q&A and just ask me whatever you like. So um, to start off with, I came out of uni in 2010, so a decade and a bit ago, and I am a myotherapist. Now, uh, myo means muscle in Latin, so I'm kind of like a muscle therapist, but I think that's a bit of a dumb term. Uh, it's a Victorian-based course that you do at uni, and lots of people don't know what it is, so I've said, you know, people have said, what's a myo to me? It's more towns, times than I can possibly count. So just wanted to put that up there. In 2012, I started a little clinic with two friends, and this was just a wonderful thing. I met so many great people. Uh, I had a lot of different sort of career highlights. I got invited to AFL clubs. I worked with pro athletes and mums and dads and just loved being able to meet people, find out what was important to them, and then help them sort of build better relationships with their bodies. Something really interesting happened to me uh, or in 2015. Uh, we accidentally started a telehealth company. And this was like way before COVID made telehealth a thing. And I say accidentally because I wasn't trying to do anything particularly commercial. I was actually really irritated by a video on YouTube for this obscure pelvic condition. Uh, the video was racking up thousands of views and it had absolutely nothing useful for anyone in it. Like it just was a useless video and I could just see people watching it and watching it. And uh, yeah, we thought we did a pretty good job with this condition. And so one day I was a bit bored and irritated and I just said, you know, can we knock it off? Let's make some videos and try and knock it off. Let's get first position. And so knock it off we did with a series of incredibly embarrassing videos that we edited ourselves. I will not give you links to these. Um, they're still up there. Um, but what happened within a week or so, which is pretty remarkable, was we started getting emails from all over the world. I remember the first one really vividly. It was a bloke from Romania named Flavius, you don't forget Flavius from Romania, who just said, I love your videos, I've watched them all, and I, you know, can you help me online? And this was a really interesting thing, because we said, you know, of course, and we, we started working on it, and it really taught me the value of sort of creating useful content, and the fact that people are very capable, once they have information, of sort of solving issues themselves. But this business had one big issue with it, and that was time zones. We were getting up at 4 a.m. to do consults, and so, long story short, in 2018, I sold my half of it and my business partner went to the US and practiced over there for, for years or since then. Um, but what that did was it gave me some thinking time and I really knew that I didn't want to grow my clinic anymore. Like I, I loved what I did, and I, but I had like employees and I, I, they, they were beautiful people, but I didn't love the experience. And I kind of had to be honest with myself, it had been about 10 years and I, I just didn't want to have lots of therapists working for me. I was also still really annoyed at lots of things in the industry. 
And the main problems that I could see was that not everyone could afford appointments and not every issue requires an appointment. You know, the little is niggle. You don't need to spend a hundred bucks on a service for that. But the main issue is that no one is taught about their bodies. And so it's all a bit confusing. It can all create a lot of worry. And what I really wanted to do was come up with the next phase of my life that basically fixed this. I wanted to find a way to help people on scale understand their bodies and how to get the most out. So the first idea I had, uh, well, not quite the first, but the first good idea I had was, can I build something where people can click on their sore spots and, you know, maybe we give them exercises or something. And to condense the last three years um, into one slide transition, that's now Body Guide, uh, which is a pretty neat app where you click on where you saw, you answer a series of questions. We actually got a bunch of physios in a room and kind of started mapping the decision processes, like the types of questions that you ask your patients and that kind of guides what exercises and education you provide. So anyway, we built that. And then at the same time, I was working on a project. In fact, I started a bit earlier called I'm Sick of Being Sore. And this is kind of everything I wasn't really allowed to put in the app, a little bit more contrarian. And yeah, it's being published next month, which is great. And everyone on this call uh, can have actually a free download to it. Um, so that's hopefully a bit exciting. Um, this is something, yeah, really close to my heart. But enough about me. I don't think we have to talk that much about me. I think today's session is really about you guys uh, learning about your bodies and hopefully feeling better in them. Um, so yeah, let's kick off with a bit of body trivia. As I said earlier, it's about uh, starting to challenge some of the underlying assumptions we might have, things we might have learned over the years that maybe are not as truthful as we thought. And uh, I think, Ray, you've got a, a poll to go with this one. I won't be able to see it, so you have to run me through Sure thing. Yep. It's uh, just been launched now. Um, so yeah, is it I'm... important to stretch before exercises? Sorry to cut you off there, right? That's okay. <laughs> that's the first one in the poll. <laughs> so that's now live. Uh, hopefully for the attendees, I'm, I'm unable to see from, from the attendee side whether or not you're able to see that poll, but uh, please uh, have a look and yeah, start start responding. That'd be great. Is it important to stretch before exercise? You know, is it important for not injuring uh, yourself or that kind of stuff? What do you reckon? We're starting to get some responses through now, Matt. So uh, it looks like the polls kind of launched all, all at the same time, but uh, we can go through answer by answer. Well, we can kill the poll. If, it's, if we're having tech difficulties, you can kill the poll and I can just go through it. No, no, the polls, polls, uh, it's just all, all, uh, all of the questions at once, but I can see all of the, the responses coming through very quickly. So I'm happy <laughs> with just giving it another minute or so. It's very exciting about the book. That was, uh, yeah, I, one of the, the really generous um, offers that you made as part of today's um, providing everybody with, with a free uh, code to download it rather than paying the, I think it's over $30 now. So um, yeah, no, thank you, mate. It's really appreciated. No worries. Excited to have people read it after so very long. I thought it would never get done, truth be told. And even once it was 95% done, it's still well. Anyway, very <laughs> it's like moving. You get the 90% done in one day and then the 10% kind of is an ongoing thing. Um, all right. So just on question one, uh, we're starting to see the answers settled down now. So we've had a uh, response to the first question. Yes, 82%. Awesome. So uh, it's actually a no. In fact, stretching is associated more with um, actually increasing injuries um, if you stretch before training. Doesn't mean warming up isn't important. Um, movement is always good. But this idea of stretching where we just hold a position or put a foot up on a fence, uh, it's actually quite a no-no now. Um, and that's why you'll never see AFL players really put a foot up on a fence or get told off. And so this is fascinating because it's like, well, hang on, wait. How many millions of hours have we spent as humans with our foot trying to touch our toes and stretch our shoulders? if in actual fact, the data suggests it's not useful and it's potentially negative. Like you're not gonna injure yourself by stretching in a minute, but yeah, we basically don't encourage anyone to do it anymore. We love warming up. We don't like these static stretches. Next question, how long for a study, uh, does it take for a study to make it into a clinical setting? So basically a whiz bang study comes out that says, hey, we don't need to stretch that much. How long do you think it takes for that to trickle down into the clinical setting so that your local physio or osteo or chiro or myo is um is talking to you about it do we think it takes seven months seven years or 17 years on average great so we have a fairly even top two the seven month responses came back at 45 percent seven years at 52 percent uh and 17 years at four percent 
that's a very clever 4%. It is very depressingly 17 years that it takes on average for a study to get from the literature into the treatment room, which, you know, if you're spending a couple of hundred bucks on a service, you probably want to, you know, really know that you're getting the absolute most up-to-date stuff. And like all industries have their issues, but this is one in the medical world that we're trying to solve. There is a massive disconnect between studies and what happens in a treatment room. Cool. So next one, is it important to do specific rehab exercises when you're sore, i.e. should you do core exercises, Pilates kind of thing for your back? Is it important that you get the right exercises for you when you're sore? 89% of us say yes. Cool, this is a depressing, this is like the bad, worst trivia ever where most people will have the wrong answer. Uh, no, it's not important at all. There've been lots of studies, particularly around back pain that kind of show if you do specific exercises, like say core for back, you do get better slightly faster in the short term, but basically over, over time, even if you were just riding a bike, your outcome's pretty much the same. It's kind of fascinating too. And it kind of plays into a lot of the talk today, which is just that we really can tell that movement, just all movement is good movement. Um, and we don't need to wrap ourselves up in cotton wool when something is sore. Is it okay for exercises to hurt when you're trying to rehab something? Slightly closer on this one. So we have 58% yes, 42% no. Yeah, so this is a really interesting one. Like it doesn't mean that like if you're doing burpees or squats or dumb fitness movements and it hurts that you should just keep going. But if you're actually sore somewhere and you're trying to explore that and you're trying to do movement stuff, um, it's totally okay for it to hurt. In fact, fascinatingly, similar to the last chat, if we do stuff that hurts uh, during our rehab, we actually get better slightly faster. But again, on a long enough timeline, it's actually even again. So it doesn't even really matter if your exercise is sore. Caveat, don't keep doing a dumb movement that makes you sore and sore and sore. That is not what I'm saying, but it's totally okay to do movements that trigger and reproduce the symptoms that you're feeling as you try and solve an issue. Second to last one. Let's see. Is it helpful to get a scan to confirm a diagnosis? So you've been sore for a while um, or just recently, and, and should we go get you an MRI or a CT or an X-ray to double check what's going on? Is it uh, a helpful? Strong 86% to the yes. Yeah, so I, I kind of love getting this data too. Um, uh, we are desperately trying to stop scanning people. So if you, if there's thought like maybe cancer or like you've been hit by a bus and we need to check what's broken, yes, scans are great. But for pain, they're actually really, really negative because it's a really unsettling experience for the patient or, uh, you know, to go through. You get sent for a scan, you start to go, wow, it must be really serious. Uh, you start to worry. You go wait in the waiting room and then you go into his machine and then you get a handout that says things like spondylolisthesis, stenosis, you know, these, these terms that we don't really know what they mean. And we also know that if you scan anyone, like almost anyone, whether they're in this pain or not, like someone who's never had pain in their life, we will see things on a scan, like little bits of degeneration and signs of wear and tear and that these are natural and normal. And what sucks is that in the past, we've taken people who are sore, we've scanned them and then we've blamed, oh, you've got a this degeneration but there's been overwhelming studies showing that we almost all of us have these things and it's a natural part of being an adult and so we can't we shouldn't be blaming that and just quietly a lot of professions or some of the health professionals one of the first things that they have done traditionally is scan you and that's pretty crazy right if the first thing they do is scan you to check your alignment and your spine and we know that in actual fact scanning someone tends to make their prognosis worse they take longer to get better pretty concerning um, so yeah Last question, uh, is there evidence that passive treatment is effective at solving recurring pain? So passive treatment is what we're used to in treatment space. Passive means you're not doing anything actively with your body. Someone else is doing something to your body. They're giving you a rub or a crack or a cupping. Is there evidence that passive treatment is effective at solving recurring pain? Lots, some, almost none. Right, so we have, uh... Lots and almost none are quite close together. Lots, 14%, almost none, 17%, which leaves 69% to the sum. This one, I'm pretty comfortable saying almost none. Someone might argue some, but it's a bit dubious um, that there's any real evidence showing that these treatments where we're not participating, where stuff is being done to our body, are effective. And this... While this is the end of the tri trivia, brings on a really interesting question. What is the deal? And I'm sure there are people watching this going, that's bullshit. 
I got a massage and I felt better, or I had a sore knee and I went to three sessions with a you know therapist and it helped massively. And what's Sorry, really Matt, just, just before you do launch into that, um, as part of the, this is bullshit, um, uh, Jane uh, asked a really good question. She said, stretches feel really good. So what, uh, what are static stretches doing that cause injury? Maybe I could ask you to address that as you go through the next section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, I'm happy to touch on that now and I'll, I'll try not swear. I'll try and be a, a good, good guy. Um, static stretching is the traditional idea that you want to hold a position for 30 seconds without any sort of weight. So when we're in yoga and we're moving, that's a kind of, but it's dynamic and we've got muscular activation happening. I'm very much talking about this idea that before I go for a run, I stretch my calves on the end of a step or I put my foot on a fence and stretch my hammy. That's the type when there's no load or activation happening through the muscle. That's the type that we used to all do a lot of and try and uh, you know think that it was helping us with our injuries. But as I said, during that question, warm-ups are incredibly important. Well, it looks like warm-ups are very important or reasonably important. I think they're incredibly important because they're so still and we will touch on that. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the, the window within the stretching that we know is a no-no now. Again, it won't, it won't injure you. It's just like, it's not useful. So do something, you know, value your time and do other things that feel better. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, like I said, most people in this call will have had a positive experience with a therapist. And, you know, I, I like to think that I created lots of positive experiences back when I was doing all massage-based therapy and also when I was doing almost exclusively movement. But the funny thing is that um, if anyone was ever tempted to jump on Twitter and follow a bunch of famous physios in the space, you would realize that Twitter is full of physios, osteos, chiros, people like me, arguing about this and wondering what is it that we're doing that's working because the evidence really doesn't support it. What the evidence does show, though, is that these four things seem to be playing a really big role in what actually happens. Placebo is super important. Um, you go and see a specialist and they take care of it for you. And that's kind of outsourced a bit like when you've got a sore tooth and you book the dentist. And for a lot of people, the tooth goes away immediately. It's kind of like I've outsourced that. Similar like with the placebo idea. It's like, you know, this has been taken care of um, and I trust that process. It's also about emotional support. It's lovely to be able to have a whinge for an hour and someone to listen to us. If anyone on this call, uh, Ray, you're, you're a young dad. Um, as adults, most of us don't get a lot of time for us. <laughs> and so going and seeing someone being able to vocalize my back's really frustrating me. Um, and then having them put their hands on you. It's not dissimilar to how you would try and support a friend. You'd give them a hug and you'd listen to them when they were in, in strife. And so we think that might be playing a bit of a role. Good therapists will tell you stop resting. Most of us still want to rest when we're sore and we get them moving. So we think that's a huge part of what's happening and the value that happens when we go to an appointment. And then time passing, which is funny because there's no time machine. So you go, yeah, I got better in three weeks with therapy, but we can't see what would have happened over three weeks if you just kept moving without the therapy. Uh, and behind all of that is this idea that we're desperately trying to teach people that they're not fragile, that bodies are super resilient and we've got to stop kind of medicalizing pain and worrying about pain. And we've got to get people moving and feeling comfortable in the process. Cool, so it should be great news. Like I know that this is sort of <laughs> a bit funny and a bit counterintuitive, but if, if you're really capable and you don't need the specific whiz bang exercise, you don't need the specific scan, but you do need to be moving and feel calm and confident, then maybe if we can teach you some things about your body, we can start to genuinely feel better, hopefully almost all of the time. This is a concept I have taught every patient that's come into my clinic for a very long time, which is to look at how we approach tension. So we run from it. We hate feeling tight. We're like, ah, get rid of that massage, anti-inflammatory. We, we kind of like go, shut up body when we're feeling tight and uncomfortable. And very rarely do any of us go, well, that's really interesting. I wonder why my body is deciding to tighten that. So today's session, we're going to talk about two types of tension that we all feel about. And then we're going to splice it up with movements and things. You don't have to do them while you're on the call, but we'll talk about some things you can genuinely do at home to help. The first type of tension is called sedentary tension. I think I called it this, so, but anyway, it basically means that on a cellular level, when you're still for long periods of time, like when you're asleep or when you're at your desk, on a cellular level, your tissue actually gets a bit stuck. It's sticky. And the way that your body gets rid of that is with friction. So as you start to move and you warm up, and this is why warming up is really important before exercise, it actually gets rid of that stickiness and you move freely. Cats sleep a lot, so they're great at getting rid of this. And I always try and bring it back to something real world because my hope is that next time you see a cat stretch, you'll hear my nasally voice in your ear saying, hey, that cat's getting rid of its sedentary tension. Good. 
<laughs> but it's just something that happens to our cells or our bodies every day. And what's interesting is we get rid of lots of it through normal movement, going for a walk to the shops, what have you. But we've evolved for a lot more than that. And so what can happen is when we move in straight lines to the shop, to the pub, and when we walk on flat surfaces, we actually deny movement to a lot of the areas that are more associated with climbing or running or jumping or twisting. And so sedentary tension can actually build up in areas and we don't even notice it because we're not using that movement. And so, you know, the real simple one that most of us like to do is if you just twist in your chair, as you watch this, even if you just turn, you feel your ribs, you feel parts of your side and it all feels a bit clunky because we don't do a lot of running and rotating as we chase the wallaby on uneven terrain anymore. So we lose that movement to that specific area and this sedentary tension builds up without us realizing. Oh, my slide just broke, I think. There we go. So in terms of tangible things you can do, on the left there is just a mock-up of sort of some of the muscles that are involved with just rotation that we have specific areas in us that try and rotate. And that exercise top right, that one where you line your back and your knee goes one way, your shoulder goes the other way, unbelievably effective for dealing with this buildup of sedentary tension. Like it's just, there's, to my mind, almost nothing better to just kind of one movement, 60 seconds each way, and you've done a huge investment in kind of staying on top of this sedentary tension that we all experience. The second one is hanging. Hanging is really interesting because we have evolved from monkeys. We're designed to climb. And when we do have our arm above our head, all of this stuff, all this tension through the front that we kind of get from our phones and our laptops, it all gets removed in one motion. And if we think about it, back to that idea that we kind of are missing some of the movements we've evolved to, the highest thing we normally do with our shoulders is maybe wash our hair. And that's still like not even past 90 degrees of shoulder movement. So some of us have gone, you know, months or even years without doing this. And if any of you want to put your fingers up on the architrave above a door or maybe you've got monkey bars down the road or something in your house you can use, as soon as you go into that position, I won't have to convince you, you're going to feel that there's all this stuff going on that you can't really tell when you're at your laptop because you're not challenging it. If there's nowhere to hang at all, and, and you can see in that picture, she's got her feet on the ground. So um, you don't, don't take your feet off the ground one arm. You, you rip your arm out socket. You won't actually, but you know what I mean. Um, towel over door, the bottom one there, that's a really lovely substitute. Just whack a towel over door, lean into it. And same thing, we're like expressing our full movement and dealing with that underlying sedentary tension that we all experience. And certainly much more so now that we're losing our incremental exercise and all the bloody gyms are closed. So. This is really helpful to understand like the why of why regular movement is so important. The second type of tension, and Ray, feel free to jump in and interrupt me if there's stuff coming through in the chat. Um, but yeah, the second type of tension is the one that we sort of get quite concerned by. So this is when, oh my God, my back's really tight or, oh, I can really feel my neck today. It's intelligent tension. I'll, I'll sort of explain this a different way. Let's imagine that my back seizes. Let's say I did something silly and my back muscles go really tight and I get really worried. Oh my God, my back's gone. God forbid we chop my head off, right? Someone comes along and chops my head off. My back muscles are gonna relax really quickly, right? Like a butcher shop window, it's gonna be a floppy. And so one of the things that we can do is kind of acknowledge that for somewhere to feel tight or you know, reasonably tight, that natural fact, it might not be much about what's happening in the muscle and natural fact, the brain is telling it to tighten. And so we can kind of see why maybe things come back over time. If we just try and give them a rub, but don't try and work out why is my intelligent two million year of old brain trying to tighten something. Ray, what you got for me? <laughs> uh, we had a, a couple of shout outs there just on the, the cat. So uh, what, one little hack was uh, maybe we should be stretching when, when our cats do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just mimic it. Um, and then there was just a couple of call outs. Um, maybe, maybe these are better served at the end, but um, uh, one, one attendee runs uh, five times a week, which is great, but now has ITBS. I must admit, I don't exactly know what that means. Uh, in, in her knee, interested in there's any uh, insight you might have there. Um, great. As well we as... That. Yeah, that, that one, like that ties right into this. So like when we're running, like force is going through the body and we're moving. Um, and that ideally is being spread evenly through, you know, beautiful coordinated connections. And sometimes when we're running, something maybe has changed slightly in our technique. And what you want to go is like, not I've got ITB syndrome, like I've got a disease or I've caught a cold. You're like, oh, something about the way that I'm running seems to be overusing my ITB. And at some point that starts to get tight and I go, oh, shut up, tension, don't worry about it. Or you roll it out or something. And then you go run some more. 
And so again, what you want to do over time, it doesn't mean that every single ache or pain or niggle that comes up, you need to pay heaps of attention to. But again, your brain's evolved over a couple of million years and it's evolved very much to let you run as much as possible because your brain thinks that's associated with you catching food, right? So it kind of reserves pain and tension and dysfunction for when it kind of wants you to pay attention. And in reality, for most runners, it's like either you're just running a bit too far, like your capacity you've reached and your body's saying, oh, back off a little bit, which runners never want to hear. Or, or and uh, something about the technique could use a little bit of, you know, uh, looking at. But I mean, runners are notorious for this. No, no offense to runners. Runners are trained culturally to like shut off all that information from their body. They're like, shut up calf. I've got five more Ks to go. Shut up knee. You know, and it's like this real endurance mindset and that whole like Arnie, like I start counting when it starts hurting. The Western fitness tries to ignore bodies and kind of ignores that. Um, yeah, things things tighten intelligently because the brain's saying, hey, I need to reinforce this area. That's great. Thanks, Matt. And I imagine there's a fair bit of this in, in the book as well. Um, this, this one came up when you were, we were talking about stretching, um, from Sally, which I, I think is a great one just to call out, which is, um, ha- okay. So maybe, maybe stretching is, is a, a question mark, but what about relaxation massages as part of a person's overall well-being? I, for one, uh, we'll, we'll call out that yeah. it's like when, the odd time that I, I get a professional massage, it's like the best day of my life. So, um, yeah, it's a beautiful time. experience. Yeah. And it ties back into that emotional support. Like there is benefit to getting a massage. It, it like if you like it and if you have a positive like all things that you have a positive experience from that involve you investing in your body is great it's more just like especially like that for, for question was for recurring pain it's like can we assume that something physical is happening that somehow changes the body what it does do is a massive effect on the nervous system you lie there for an hour and in a lot of ways i think me- massages enforced meditation because meditation is trying to stay focused on one thing you know counting your breath or um, whatever you know, object meditation. And so when you're face down on that table and you're going, oh, that's sore, ah, right? You're only thinking about that. You're not thinking about your bills. You're not thinking about your partner. You're just tuning in with your body. And in that way, your nervous system just gets kind of down-regulated. And so one way that I would encourage people, and I always say that getting massages is great, but you kind of want to be doing it for the right reason, which is I really enjoy this. And I find real value in taking an hour out of my day to go and do this thing for me. And that's incredibly powerful and valuable. So yeah, this is really more about like us starting to think about our bodies more as in as the slide that we're still on here. Like as like the brain is the thing controlling it. If a massage, you, know, you shove an elbow in, you calming down is what's relaxing the muscle. It's not that the elbow has relaxed the muscle. Otherwise you'd be terrified of someone giving you a big hug. Because if someone hugging you in pressure could change your body, you get a hug and you'd be crooked for a day. Um, so yeah, it's really about what's happening with the nervous system. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Uh, and just a couple of comments actually from, uh, clearly runners in the, in, in the group here who have absolutely, they've said you've totally nailed how they feel, uh, what their approach is, what they think. And, um, yeah, you clearly know, no runners very well. So you hit a call there. You learn to never tell a runner to stop running. You'd learn that very early on in your, in your career as a therapist, you just never bother. Um, you try and yeah, drip feed the stuff with the, the lure of running further and further. Um, but yeah, so intelligent tension is the idea that the brain is controlling the show and that we don't have to think I've got a bad elbow, I've got a bad neck, I've got a dicky knee. It's like, ah, oh, it's curious. Now, this idea um, went absolutely viral on some level. Um, this idea that, uh, you know, changes in our body can create intelligent adaptations from our like our brain essentially so like this is just showing as your head goes forward as you look at your phone your head is heavy and your intelligent brain it notices that more load is going into the neck and therefore it will tighten the muscles of the neck and that's really good because it stops your head falling off right <laughs> it's not a sign of a bad neck it's an incredibly evolved nervous system just going oh there's more weight here let's add some tension and yeah, this, I think 2013 or something, went a really ugly version of this just went absolutely viral on Facebook. Um, and then I think this is from the guy and they picked it up recently. Um, so this might not be new, but um, yeah, it's interesting. Like the brain will adapt to the environment and the position you're in. And we often just forget that we're heavy. So back to the runners, there's some studies that show that with every step you take, five times your body weight goes through your hips. So like every step. And we just forget that we're heavy. But if 80 kilos in a trolley was coming at you around the park, you know, 
you'd be pretty nervous about getting in the way. Like we are heavy beings and gravity pushes down and that has effects. And we just totally ignore it. We think a weight is external, like a dumbbell or a plate. And we think of ourselves as lightweight, which is also why we get confused, why we get sore when we're not doing anything. It's like, how does that work? Anyway, these ideas are not new. Uh, they've been around for a long time. And what I love to introduce people to is Ida Rolf, who is not a household name, but she kind of deserves to be. This woman was incredible in the 1940s with no medical background whatsoever. She was a biochemist. So she's not a medical doctor, she's a biochemist. She saw people suffering around her long before we even had this idea of physical therapy uh, or modern physical therapy. And she just figured, you know, maybe I can just apply science to this. Maybe I can look at the body as a series of levers that, you know, if the head does sit further forward, that would make more load relative to gravity. If the hips are doing a rotation and I've got a bit of a sway back, maybe that would change the load moving around the body. And so she saw the human body as being this intelligent thing that responds to gravity and adapts to it. And the logo for Rolfing, so she started a whole movement, I think is one of the clearest, most beautiful examples of branding. Uh, and clear communication because you go, well, okay, this is sort of what good therapists do. They go, yeah, sure, you're, sure your neck's sore, but well, it's not, your neck's not happening in isolation. So maybe something's shifted in its foundations or maybe there's something above it that's supplying extra load. And so uh, traditional rolfing was really interesting. Actually, she would do 10 sessions and kind of first session would be like reattach the shin to the foot, reattach the upper leg to the shin. We're still very manual therapy based. Um, but this was sort of the thing uh, that she worked on. And yeah, it was incredible for the time. This is a woman in the 40s um, doing groundbreaking work in a field that wasn't her own. There's a little quote from her. Some individuals may perceive their losing fight with gravity as a sharp pain in their back, others as the unflattering contour of their body. Those over 40 may call it old age. And yet all these signals may be pointing to a single problem. They are off balance. They are at war with gravity. And I, I know shoving a bunch of text on a slide and reading a quote that you can read faster than I can read it out is a bit annoying, but I still just wanted to get some semblance of this idea of like, we don't talk about gravity, we don't think about it. But if gravity is the thing with the changes in our body as we age and things that is making some areas more active than others, well, a massage isn't gonna change that necessarily. You know, If we wanna physically change our body, there's something else going on there. Again, not bagging out massage if you love massage. So should I just stand up straight all day? <laughs> is that the message that I'm trying to get along here that like posture is really important or something? And in actual fact, no, you don't have to at all. Bodies are incredible. You can slouch for 40 years, you won't die. Bodies are amazing. Um, but it does kind of bring into this idea, like what, what is the solution? And so let's say that we are a bit out of whack. What's the thing that we're missing in our bodies that's, that could help us stand up straight all the time without even thinking about it? What's the thing we're all kind of craving in that space? And this requires another very short little story about the biosphere. <laughs> so um, do you have any more questions? Before I I'm happy to keep cruising, but with this sort of a, we can jump into the biosphere in a sec. A couple of questions coming through. Um, actually, two, two specific questions around yoga, um, yoga apps and uh, impact on the body um, designed on, I guess, I called, the call out there was algorithms, but I guess there's a, a journey that you go through to try and make it as effective as it can be. Um, do you have any insights or thoughts on, on yoga? Oh, I think, I mean, I think yoga is like a map of what human movement is um, in a lot of ways and a lot of like good quality rehab skills concepts from yoga, but like much sort of deeper concepts. Like there was, there's some pretty amazing stuff if you go deep in it. The main, if I stay with like a bit of a contrarian or a problem thing with yoga is that humans are fickle and we do what we're good at. And humans have different levels of innate flexibility. Some people have tissue that's actually a bit kind of more malleable and floppy, like the levels of collagen in their tissue is different. And so they're actually naturally really flexible and flexibility, you can almost use a different word for that. And this is like a really naughty word in therapy. You're not meant to say this, but it sounds scary, but it doesn't need to be scary. Flexibility can also be considered kind of instability. It means that joints can move further out of their natural range. And so with yoga, I love it. I think it's really important, but I also think it's really important for different body types. And one of the issues you see in the treatment space is you get naturally flexible people that go to yoga and they get a big pat on the back saying, good job, you're amazing. You progress through all these poses and you're naturally really flexible. And we're, we're fickle. We go, great, I'm good at yoga. I'm going to do more yoga. So yoga is often really helpful for the people that are rubbish at it. <laughs> the stiff people of the world. My old business partner was one of the stiffest people I ever saw as a therapist. And I'm, I'm the opposite end and was sort of too flexible for my own good when I was younger. 
And so, yeah, yoga, I think is really good. And I, but I'd encourage people to gravitate towards strength-based yoga, as opposed to, I'm just in a hot room trying to rotate my spine as far as I can go. Um, but I'm definitely happy to talk more about that later. If we, if we just quickly go back to like the early slides, basically all, all movement is good. <laughs> like if you're enjoying it and you're moving your body, you're going to be helping all the systems that help you self heal. Um, so all movement is good. It's not about picking fights with a, running is amazing. Yoga is amazing. Deadlifting is amazing. Finding yeah. stuff that you enjoy doing with your body is amazing. What's the most good we can do? <laughs> Everything good. What's the most good? <laughs> um, so I tried to get a little bit in this, but I didn't, but the, I guess the one thing I'll keep talking about is the one thing that really is sort of missing for a lot of us is, is um, heaviness in our lives, but that's sort of the rest of this chat. Uh, one from Kieran, uh, if the brain's controlling, um, then how do you, how do you keep your brain fit? As in, are there, um, any interesting exercises or insights you might have around, uh, yeah, exercises for self-talk was a call out there? Yeah. So, I mean, as a shameless plug, that's kind of what the book and the app are kind of tr trying to help do. Um, it's not a complete solution, but it's getting closer. And in terms of like a 30 minute chat, it's pretty, pretty tricky, but I think, um, yeah, a lot of these principles, it's kind of like any self-help book or whatever, like for everyone, it will have different implications of what they should be doing and playing around with. Um, and even revisiting it in six months or 12 months, uh, there's, there's a different type of value for people. So at different points in their life, different movements are effective and helpful according to what they're doing. But I definitely think like trying to stay away from the idea that your body is bad or broken or fragile and always wanting to, you know, slowly increase movement, particularly when things are sore, like exploring and learning about, if your neck's sore, learn about the area, the shoulder and the shoulder blade, and, as opposed to just going, oh, it's sore there and I need a specific exercise for that soreness. And it comes back to just exploring. Um, so yeah, the idea with um, the biosphere, so we just kind of stopped off with this idea of like, what's the, what's the go? If I'm like slouching or whatever, what's, what's, what's the solution? In the desert in the 70s and 80s, they built these massive greenhouses in the US. And it's kind of like that movie, The Martian with um, Matt Damon, where he had to grow his potatoes. Um, <laughs> you need to like protect the environment. That's kind of why they were doing these experiments. But think massive scale, like full trees, people lived in them and they, they just, uh, you know, uh, perfect nutrients, perfect light, everything. And so as you can imagine, everything grew really, really well. And they were really chuffed. <laughs> they nailed it. And then something strange happened, which was after a period of time of everything being really healthy and happy, the trees started falling over. And the scientists were confused. Like they looked initially like, is it, is it disease? Like what's going on? And what they realized fairly quickly was that they hadn't accounted for something the trees really, really, really need to survive and thrive and that's wind. So the pressure and force of wind and gravity, it actually triggers an adaptive response in trees where they grow thicker branches and a different type of bark even, just relative to the pushing of the wind. And they need that to hold on to the weight of the body. It's also why your little indoor plant at home is probably snaking its way towards the light. These adaptations, you know, for them, it's light. Um, for us, it's, it's much more just sort of gravity. And our bodies 100% adapt to load and gravity. That is the main thing that changes our bodies. So if I was to bet you, that I could, I bet you a thousand dollars that I'm going to get a massive Ar Arnie bicep using just this pencil. I'm going to do this. Bet you a thousand bucks, Ray. I'm going to get massive with this pencil. You would say, and anyone sensible would say, I'll take that bet. That's a bit ridiculous. You bloody need some weight if you want your bicep to grow bigger. To us, <laughs> we need a certain amount of heaviness in our lives to keep our bodies upright. Like we actually do have these internal chains of tissue. That's nothing to do with the bicep and nothing to do with neck muscles that help us stand up straight. You know, they hold us up relative to gravity. And we sort of are notorious and we're sort of underloading our bodies. We don't have enough load, but at the same time, there is always still gravity. So if we're in these rubbish positions for ages, our body is adapting to these positions. It's kind of being programmed. So eight hours of pressure in this position kind of creates this impetus. That the body kind of reinforces itself in this position. And so for a lot of us, we then try and stand up straight, but our lifestyle has actually kind of programmed us here. And that's gravity, even though you didn't have a weight on your back, that's just gravity. And so we spend a lot of time trying to sit up straight and it's bloody uncomfortable. And then we just feel shit about ourselves being like, well, I'm doing a bad job of this. And also adding tension to something that isn't built that way can be quite uncomfortable. So forcing yourself to sit up straight actually creates a lot more problems, I think, than just being there for a while. 
but we kind of ignore that. We just internalize that our body's shit. Sorry, go stop swearing. And that we can't stand up straight and we have bad posture. And like everyone thinks they have horrendous posture. So we've all either got the same posture or we're all doing okay. Um, <laughs> but this is um, a really key element to understand that our body is adapting to our environment. And it is amazing. So if you do constantly load your body in one position, it's as simple as maybe thinking about how to apply a balancing load. Something opposite, something different, something varied that gets your body out of this position. Here is an incredibly unscientific slide. No one forwarded this to anyone. It's useful to learn from, but it's really not. Yeah. It basically says that sitting's low load. It's just gravity. So you can do it for eight hours. It's not going to have a massive effect, right? But it builds up over time. And if you did want to cancel out that programming, you could try maybe eight hours of stretching because the same thing is true with stretching. There's no load there. So there's no reason to change. So it doesn't actually have a big effect. You get some blood flow, great. And you get kind of this like, yeah, I did my bit. I did my little stretching but it doesn't make a huge difference to how you feel day to day. When we start using strategic load, we can, again, very bad math, unscientific. We can start to look at this idea of sort of, maybe I can challenge eight hours of sitting low load with an opposing movement like hanging, higher load, higher adaptation. And maybe I can kind of stay on top of it a bit. Like when I'm hungry, I top up and I have a bit of food. When I'm hungry, I top up and have a bit of food. Maybe we can start to think of our bodies not as like this, sedentary thing for 40 hours and then we flog ourselves in the gym three times a week maybe we can think about our bodies as being constantly adapting and maybe craving a more balanced load in our lives and that's kind of cool because it means you don't have to find you know five hours a week to tick that box and i know so many of us struggle working full time trying to eat healthy trying to be good partners trying to you know get to gym and stuff it, it really is very time intensive this stuff and it doesn't need to be at least not the basic maintenance and so the what can you do thing a bit about this is, is really this idea that I try and teach everyone, which is micro dosing movement. <laughs> and most of us try, like we're told, hey, take an hour break or, or you know, two minute break from your desk every hour, do your stretches. But the problem is this is really old school and these things, getting up and making a cup of tea doesn't undo the fact that we've been in a position for eight hours and we need to find a way that does start to create a little bit more balance in our lives. And so what does this actually look like? It looks like going and making a cup of tea and while you're waiting for it to boil, doing some actual sort of exercise positions. And these are just ones I picked out, that one bottom left, if anyone wants to try it, that gets your abs going pretty quick. Um, down dog, top left, people think of that as maybe a stretch, but gravity is pushing down. And if you want proof there's load involved in that open shoulder position, just hold it for 60 seconds and you'll notice you get bloody tired. And so to my mind, the thing that is truly missing in the Western world is movement at home. So we sort of take movement out of the home. We are at home and we do not, particularly during COVID. Um, and then we would go and put movement outside of the home in a gym or a fitness class. And we would encourage ourselves to do things during the day. I better take a break and go for a walk. But that still is actually not quite enough to stay on top of the sedentary tension, which is what normally leads to the intelligent tension where your body's really trying to protect somewhere. And that's still the point, right? Like 60 minutes once a week is, is, is kind of a waste of your time and money if you're not doing anything else useful in between. Um, it's great if you want to massage, like again, for that wellness point of view. Um, but there is just an argument to look at our bodies a little bit more sensibly for what they need and not what the Western version of fitness is and the Western version of appointments. That we actually have this ongoing need during the day to do stuff. And we don't have to do it every day and you won't die if you don't. It's really just about understanding that your body has needs kind of like sleep and like food. It wants to be moved in various ways during the day and it needs a little bit of weight in those so that it can adapt and stay tall and strong. And it may well be the one thing that's good about COVID <laughs> because if you want to bloody do your down dog in the boardroom with a hundred people around you and you're wearing your fancy you know, work pants, your slacks and you rip them, you're going to have a bad time. Um, and so this stuff, we haven't really ever had an opportunity to do this really well uh, up until this point. We haven't had an opportunity where we can turn our camera off and do a bit of movement on the floor. And that is so much more effective than coming and forking out 200 bucks a week to come and see me. And that's the exciting thing is that you're actually capable, even when you're sore, the movement is really key. And as a final thought, grab a dog toy, grab a tennis ball, grab a baseball. If you can't be bothered moving, I love people self-treating, self-massaging. There's no right or wrong, really. You just fly on something. You let gravity push down. You get that amazing, oh my God, that sore, a bit of meditation, you calm down. And 
I'm still astonished that uh, so few therapists teach people to self-treat and self-manage because as the people pointed out, when you do go and have pressure on your body and you do relax for a second, your brain does calm down. It is positive. It's just really cool to do like five minutes every day as opposed to 60 minutes once a week. And then I don't go for another six months because I'm not really sore. And that's sort of where the, uh, yeah, it all balances out. That's, that's my rant. That's me done. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Thank you, Matt. That was, uh, uh, yeah, a bit, bit mind boggling, actually. It's, um, well, I always enjoy the, the contrarian side and, and kind of commend you on, on being brave and out there on a couple of points. I think, you know, some of the, given, given how many people are, are still here, you know, that that's always a really big sign for me that, uh, yeah, you've hit a chord there. So uh, thank you. I've, I've, I've just seen a hand raise. Um, if I could ask you just to pop your question in, I'm, I'm unable to give you access to, uh, to chat, but we will through through the um, chat function uh, we can we can answer. Um, I think you kind of touched on that at the end, but uh, where does Pilates scale on? Uh, sorry, where where's Pilates on your scale of goodness? Oh, um, I, I mean, again, all movements great movement, and I think there's lots of really useful things in Pilates. Um, my one concern with, and it's not just Pilates, but and this is kind of just again my concern with like the industry is that for squillions of years, thousands and thousands, whatever, all your muscles, including your core muscles, have only really ever worked when your feet were on the ground to keep you stable when you're running and to help you carry things. And I think, and I experienced this doing rehab, especially in the chronic pain space. I've got some noise coming through the background. Um, I think that it doesn't work very well anytime when your foot isn't in a natural position. So I think you get really good at, so the, the critique would be, depending on your teacher, and obviously there's like different things that happen in every Pilates class. But sometimes I think the argument is you do Pilates and you get much better at Pilates because bodies are like that. But I, I worry that unless the foot's on the ground in a stable position, it doesn't translate to when you're moving. So you get really strong in these awkward positions where in your back and you're pushing on the bar and things. But that when you actually then go and walk around and go pick something heavy up, it's actually like a really different thing that you're training your body to do. And so I, with all movement, like I always encourage people to train their foot, uh, you know, when they're doing weights and things. And I always would hide from exercises if I was doing it to like make my body better and better, I would stay away from exercise where the foot wasn't doing something natural, which could almost be a whole other talk. Um, but yeah, it's still really good and great to move and great to exercise. I've spent a lot of my life in the chronic pain rehab space trying to fix people that perceive they were really busted. And for those people, I really get rid of non-natural foot weight bearing because uh, yeah, core connects to everything as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and probably, uh a really good opportunity as well i'd be delighted to learn um how you and the team at body guide are working with those that are kind of hr managers or uh, people leaders on the call what, what are some of the, the interesting uh, approaches and, and work you're, you're doing there yeah so i think if we look at it like fairly objectively the, the data suggests that sort of 60 65 of us are sore on a weekly basis like almost all of us and when we're sore we actually have really almost swore, really bad options in front of us. So as a consumer, as an employee, as a human, we can go to Dr. Google and get confused, or we can agree to pay $100 for a service in three days time with no guaranteed outcome. We don't know how many appointments we need or not. And that's why two thirds of us, particularly in Australia, when we're sore, we do nothing about it. We just wait and hope it goes away. And that's something I'm really passionate about, like this idea that like, we can't, like that's a huge ask for a person to go and fork out that cash for that service. So your employees, just like everyone else, are just sitting on these niggles and not dealing with them. And so for me, I'm really interested in breaking the appointment structure. So we do stuff with asynchronous video chat where I record messages for um, you know, particular activations like work from home setup. And I'll, I'll make a video saying, hey, you know, so great to have you on the team with Employment Hero. Um, I, my job is to help you work from home safely. Just you know, send me a video of your desk and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And it means they can do it asynchronously and get support and ask questions and we've lowered the bar for them. So we're encouraging them to act earlier. And then the employer wins, the insurer wins, the government wins. And I think on a lot of levels, like health will always suit a single payer model because the cost really does go to the employer. And so I think, you know, the stuff we do with Bodyguard, I guess to answer the question is, yeah, Bodyguard subscriptions, very aware that people don't love, like not all people like apps. So we try and take as much of the content out of the app and put that into like monthly activation packs. So we can take a video about, you know, how your, the angle of your thumb can change your neck tension and like fun videos like that that are helpful. <laughs> and you can just push them out on your channels across your Slack or your Instagram, what have you. 
has a little QR code so encourages them to bop it and get the app. But we kind of want to be more than an app and, and sort of have that asynchronous support element that's much cheaper and easier than an appointment, have content being put in front of people like this webinar, say, that helps them, you know, keep front of mind physical health is important and I care about it. And really meeting the consumer with that need because they are sore. They don't necessarily want an app but they do love to learn about their bodies. And that's the thing we've seen consistently across all of our like power users that have like repeated their programs over and over again. They just love learning because bodies are interesting. As soon as you get away from blaming and telling them they're bad and broken, it's a really interesting space. So yeah, uh, subscriptions, but mostly content packs, driving people back to the apps to encourage them to use it. And then yeah, uh, this sort of compliance piece with work from home or manual handling or whatever activations the organization's trying to get over the line. I love the idea of the uh, asynchronized, personalized guidance on, especially for work from home, right? It's like, how, how in the world do I get to 50 people's offices? Um, so yeah, that's great. Um, on that point, actually, we had a, a question. Um, what are some tips you use to better align yourself when you're stuck at a desk all day? My posture is having a hard time adjusting. Yeah, so I mean, a stand option is great, but like lots of people go really excited about a stand option, like being able to switch between the two. You don't want just stand or just sit, but I think that's a big part of it for people. But again, if we can get this micro dosing of movement in, what you really want to do is go, you know, after two hours, I have gone to make a cup of tea. We, it, we want to get buried movement into those spaces. And that's what's going to cut off that constant, like bad posture messaging going into your body. We want to incrementally just acknowledge that Every hour we're at our desk, there's a, there's a stimulation happening or an adaptation happening. It's low level, not going to kill you. And so we understand there's just like a math equation there where we want to move a bit more. Again, not just lean back and arch our back and go, oh, that feels better. I've got some blood flow. We want to actually get into body weight positions that are a bit challenging for us. And, and it really doesn't matter where you start, just getting some muscular activation to break up all the no activation, right? <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, would you start each day with a targeted stretch or finish with it? Oh, um, I reckon by the end of the day, my self-improvement energy is pretty run out. Like, like we, we have a finite amount of energy to, to do good things for us. And for a lot of us, if we push outside that, the other kind of self-destructive behaviors get bigger as well. So, you know, it kind of ties to, you might only have a half an hour a day that you can put to it. You might have 20 minutes, what have you. And I think... Um, I, I quite like doing stuff on like the middle of the day. That's when I kind of have the most energy and I also want my brain to reset, but it doesn't matter. Like mornings, yes, do a bit of movement because you've got that sedentary tension building up it, like a cat wakes up again. Um, but, you know, really it's just about what works for you and your lifestyle. There is no magic recipe as long as you are feeling like you're not going in a bad direction. And if you are, that's your, you know, there's the little voice in you saying, I can tell something's not quite right and I want to invest in it. And if you want to invest in it in the evening or the morning, that's fine. And I think, you know, the exercise that I would look to, really the big ones are adding rotation. And then honestly, one arm hangs is like, like every now and then someone will have a, a slight issue with it. But like, it's pretty universally, unbelievably helpful to have that during the day. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, and, and while we're wrapping up, I think we've got about a minute left. There is the QR code on the screen that you're looking at. So uh, plenty of comments came in. I think you've got a couple of very keen uh, readers of the book who will be eagerly waiting the email. But um, if you did want to hit hit up Matt uh, and the team directly uh, through the QR code, he's got his direct links there. I know um, you know, more is more when it comes to questions with Matt. He's um, always happy to answer questions. So please do feel free to drop him or, or of course, us at Employment Hero a note. Um, love the idea of microdosing. This has come up, um, just calling out if that's something that you try to bake into your app. Yeah, I mean, so the app is like, um, it is a series of, it's basically built into sessions. So like you, you answer your questions, you get a program that takes you through, not just where you saw, but kind of this body literacy program that keeps teaching you. But like you can do two minutes in the morning, two minutes at two in the morning. It doesn't matter. Um, you can break it up however you like. Some people do a whole session all at once, about half an hour, but others just kind of come and go from it. And they invariably find like three things that really, really work. They love a few things that work well and a few things they kind of do once or twice. And that's totally okay too. But it's just all there for you with tutorials. So it kind of makes life easier. Good, man. Thank, thanks, Matt. I really, really appreciate it. I, um, yeah, a couple of... Um, really intriguing insights that uh, I, I think is you can only get from having 10 hours uh, 10,000 hours of uh, expertise in an industry so uh, to steal from some of your your time in the industry and, and kind of get straight to the point has been absolutely tremendous and um, one thing I always really love is uh, practical takeaways that we can start to adopt in our 
day to day and, and you've been really terrific with that. Um, comments have been flooding throughout, mate. Uh, really, really positive. So thank you so much. And, and for everybody, you will receive an email after the call today. You'll receive a copy of the recording, receive a copy of the link. We absolutely won't forget the code. And um, yeah, feel free to use that as an invitation to get the conversation going um, because we're absolutely happy to help where we can. Uh, Matt, thank you so much. And, and thank you to everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening. It's, it's lovely to be here. So yeah, have a great day. Happy moving. <laughs> thanks, mate.